Good evening. In the last four episodes, we have covered the history of the October 1917 revolution, which, as we know, brought communis communism into power in Russia. In this episode, we will attempt, attempt to take a slightly different historical path and explore what appears at the distance of 100 or even 200 years, a paradox, namely this, why the communist revolution succeeded in Russia and not in any other Western European country where it had been tried. And the most notable being, of course, the French uprising of 1848, which ended up with the establishment of another Napoleon and another emperor, Napoleon III, as if the French had not had enough of the first Napoleon. Another French revolution in 1871 went down in history unsuccessfully as the Paris Commune, commune as in communist. Now, as we know, the so-called Industrial Revolution exploded in Europe in the 19th century. The term revolution is appropriate, just as it is appropriate for any set of condition and events that fundamentally shake or alter an established way of life. In such a way, do it the alter in such a way as to make the event a kind of watershed, a dramatic discontinuity from the past, a turning over, a revolution. But not all wars imply a revolution, nor all revolutions imply a war. The communication revolution started in the last decade of the 20th century with the Internet is an example of a warless, warless revolution. But returning to the 19th century Industrial Revolution, we all know the horrible conditions that affected the lives of millions of impoverished, impoverished men, women and children who migrated from the famine-threatened countryside to the towns in search for a better way of life or just plainly survival. Instead, they became literally slaves of machines which sometimes killed them. They were wretched, peop wretched people forced to live in unimaginable conditions of degradation. Anyone who read the novel or some novels by the English Charles Dickens or the French Emile Zola or Zola, for example, will gain a pretty good idea of the life of the proletariat. Russia was industrially less advanced than the other European countries. The majority were peasants working the land and serfdom, serfdom, a system where the, where the peasants were part of the property of an estate and were bought and sold with the land, ended only in 1861 under the Tsar Alexander II. In fact, estate owners were taxed on the basis of how many serfs called souls they had, and often they didn't know how many souls they had, as the counts were not very frequent. On this fact is based the plot of Gogol's novel Dead Souls, where the protagonist visits country towns attempting to buy from the nobles dead souls, the souls of the serf who were dead, with the idea of later getting a loan based on the fictitious souls that he had purchased. Anyway, the purpose of this introduction is to properly frame the question why the attempted 19th century social revolutions in Western Europe all failed and why only the Russian Revolution succeeded. The 1917 revolution was both a Russian and the world phenomenon. To explore these historical roots, we must start with, with a wide generalization. The Russians, in their spiritual character, are a people of the East. But during the two centuries prior to 1917, they had been heavily subjected to the influence of Western European thought, especially Germany and France, to the point, to the point that it had become habitual in the upper classes not only to learn French, but to speak it currently among themselves. In 1812, Russia had defeated Napoleon, but the relationship between Russia, Russia the victor, and French the defeated was at the opposite end of, for example, the relationship of the United States with 
National Socialist Germany after the end of World War II. In the 19th century, we can broadly distinguish two currents of thoughts among the Russian intelligentsia. The Slavophiles, that is, those who believe in an inherent special force and mission of the Slav people, and the Westernizers. As we will see th uh, through some of their characters, the two currents changed during the century, though keeping, keeping some of their core, core characteristics. The Slavophiles maintain that there is an organic unity in Russian history and that his, Russia has a special destiny in the development, development of mankind. In turn, the core of the idea had to do with the nature of the Christian Orthodox religion. In previous historical sketches, we discussed the schism of, 15, of 1154 that divided Christianity between Catholicism, associated with Rome, and Orthodoxy, associated with Eastern European, Eastern Europe and Russia. Then, with the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453, Moscow was to become the Third Rome, because the real Rome with the, with the papacy was not considered the heir, the heir of Christianity, at least in Eastern Europe. Evidence of this point of view can be found in the Arabic language. For the Arabs, Rum or Rome refers to the Orthodox Church, whereas they refer to the Catholics as French, given the early connection between the Church of Rome with the Western Roman Empire of Charlemagne. Now, in the history of Russia, we can broadly distinguish five periods. The Russia dominated by Kiev, or Kievan Rus, and it is the same Ukrainian Kiev that now pretends to have nothing to do with Russia, which is an absurdity that defies description. Then there was the, the Tartar period, the Moscow period, the Russia of Peter the Great, and the Soviet Russia. We should, of course, also include the sixth and current Russia, but historically speaking, it is a somewhat premature to assign to it definite historical features. We could call it charismatic capitalism, maybe, given the prominence of Vladimir Putin, but this is all tentative and uh, speculative. Let's just call it for the moment post-Soviet Russia. The first, the Kiev Russia, uh, had actually a higher or comparable culture to that of the contemporary West, at least in architecture and plastic arts, and I'm referring to the 14th century. It was an Eastern culture, the culture of the Christianized Tartar Empire, but it still did not have the organic unity that facilitated the growth of literature and philosophy. The soul of the Russian people was molded by the Orthodox Church, we could say, it was a religious mold that somehow has filtered down to the 19th century, even among the nihilist, as we will see later. And paradoxically, paradoxically, this, this caste, this, this mold, this mindset, preserved itself even in communism. No doubt, no doubt, you will have heard or read about the influence of the Orthodox Church in today's Russia, where the Church has become a kind of symbol of preservation of Christian values, a symbol and a front opposed to the rampant spirit of globalization typified by the insistence on what for some is modernism and for some degeneracy, the approval of or even encouragement of sexual deviancy, the miscegenation, the idea that national borders are racist, the disparagement and even the destruction of the family and so on. Another shaping influence on the Russian soul, be, besides the Christian Orthodox element, has to do with the immensity of geographic Russia. And this influence has inspired and instilled in the people at large a form of natural paganism. Therefore, we have the blending of two elements, the primitive natural paganism combined with the Orthodox asceticism inherited from Byzantium and both contributing to a psychological reaching out towards the other world or another world different from ours. Along the same line of thought, we could say that the immensity of Russia, its boundlessness, its formlessness, 
was expressed in the Russian soul. In comparison, the West was more favorable to the development of what we broadly call civilization, things and concepts such as boundaries, categories, structures, organizations of various kinds. Russian historians explain the despotic, the despotic character of the Russian government as something evolving from the necessity to organize an immense territory. And this was reflected even during Soviet Russia, where what we call the day-to-day -day interests of the people were sacrificed to the power and organization of the state. On the other hand, the religious base of the Russian spirit created some specific attributes, such as dogmatism, asceticism, the ability to endure suffering, making sacrifices for the sake of a faith, a reaching out to the transcendental in relation both to eternity and to this world. We see this reaching to the transcendental, especially in the classics of Russian literature. On the other hand, this religious energy could direct itself to objectives that are not only religious, that is, to social objects. And the combination, the combination of dogmatism and asceticism makes Russians somewhat both apocalyptic and nihilist. The word nihilist has two meanings. Nihil in Latin means nothing, and therefore a nihilist is one who believes that life is meaningless, therefore he is an extreme atheist. In time, in time, as this is the second meaning, a nihilist came to mean a supporter of the extreme revolutionary parties at the end, at the end of the 19th century. Nihilism and anarchism are close allies, and the political assassinations both in the 19th and the 20th century in Russia and throughout Europe are directly traceable to nihilist anarchists. But connecting again to the threads of history, there were two important events that, we could say, shook the fabric of the established order. One was primarily religious and the other primarily political. The primarily religious event in the 17th century had to do with the reform of some religious rituals in the Orthodox Church. Rituals primarily centered on ceremony, specifically if the sign of the cross should be made this way, according to the old believers, or this way, according to the new believers. A reform spearheaded by the patriarch Nikon or Nikon in 1666-1667. As usual, the symbol is indicative as an underlying reality. In this instance, the old believers felt that the faith of the Third Rome was betrayed, that the Antichrist had taken over, and the old believers therefore went underground. The Russians referred to this schism with the word raskol, which means cleaving apart. The repression of the old believers, from all historical accounts, was quite brutal. The old believers, which we may refer to as the left wing of the, mov of the movement, went underground. And by the way, by the way, for curiosity, the controversy was only resolved in 1971 when the Russian Orthodox Patriarchate revoked the anathema imposed on the old believers in the 17th century. In any event, as I said, the issue of the ceremonials and the signs of the cross was an index, an index of a more profound split between a more secular church, meaning the new believers, oriented towards the, the, towards the earth with all its, with all its injustices, and, and on the other side the old believers who were looking for an earthly kingdom uh, of justice associated nevertheless with the mythical city of Kitets or Kitetsk on the Volga River, a mythical town that had become invisible during the Mongol invasion of Russia, but that was still there, was still there to be found. Similarly, during the 19th century, the revolutionary intelligentsia believed that the forces of evil capitalism, the secular counterpart of the Antichrist, had taken over and that only a revolution could enable Russians 
to locate some kind of new city of Gitez. The second important event that shook, that shook the fabric of the established order were the reforms conducted by Peter the Great, who may be considered the first Bolshevik. Why? Academic historians may, may say that this is a gross oversimplification, but one of, this, of, of his revolutionary, we could say, administrative reforms was to establish what became known as the Table of Ranks, a formal list of the titles assigned to positions in the military, the government and the court. A consequence of this reform was a dramatic reduction of the powers of the class of the boyars, the Russian name that defines the old aristocrats, roughly equivalent to what in Western Europe is or was a prince. Before the reform, high-ranking state positions were hereditary, but now anyone, including a commoner, could advance in the bureaucratic hierarchy with sufficient hard work and skill. Consequently, a new generation of what today we would call technocrats supplanted the old boyars class and dominated the civil service in Russia. It was a system that remained in place until 1917, the revolution. Peter the Great became famous in history for having traveled in Western Europe to learn directly skills that he could import into Russia, and notably in the field of shipbuilding. And he was determined, determined to the point of brutality, to carry out his modernizing reforms. Here is another reason, for perhaps for calling Peter the Great the first Bolshevik. For example, his eldest son, by the name called an heir, called Alexei, was suspected of being involved in a plot to overthrow the emperor. Alexei was tried and confessed under torture during questioning, conducted this questioning being conducted by a secular court. He was convicted and sentenced to be executed, but Alexei died in prison before he was executed as a result of torture. And Alexei's mother, Eudoxia, was punished and tried on false charges of adultery. The Slavophiles, the Russian Slavophiles of the 19th century, saw in Peter's reforms a violation and an interruption of Russia's natural development. The Westernizers, on the other hand, saw nothing original in Russian culture and felt that Peter had just attempted, attempted to adapt Russia to the history, to the culture of the times. In reality, Russian culture, notably in the literature, Begun, begun to bloom during the and following what came to be called the Petrine or Petrine reforms. One famous name is the poet and writer Pushkin. But perhaps Peter the Great was also the first Bolshevik for the way he dealt with the Russian people in carrying out his reforms. Similarly, we could say that reforms were necessary at the stage that Russia was in the first part of the 20th century. And also similarly, the bloodshed that accompanied and followed the 1917 resolu re revolution rather, shook the roots and souls of the Russian people. Not unlike the Bolsheviks, Peter the Great ridiculed the religious feelings and of the old days. He even established a, 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 a patriarch called Teofan Prokopovich, Prokopovich, who was essentially a Protestant with a rationalist strain associated with German, German Protestantism. To ridicule the old religious feelings, Peter even organized a mock religious council with a mock patriarch, which suggests, suggests that that is in ridiculing religion a parallel between Peter the Great and Lenin. But the parallel ends here. For Peter's reform, while strengthening the state and bringing Western European-inspired enlightenment to Russia, also widened the gulf between the common people and the cultured and ruling, ruling class. Meaning, meaning that the common people remained untouched 
by the new wave of rationalism. Some consciously, many unconsciously, found refuge in their hidden spiritual life. And to this period in history belongs the typical Russian figure of the Starchestvo, Starchestvo a monk of great piety to whom common folks would resort for, for spiritual counsel. One such typical character we find in the brother Karamazov novel, in the, the novel by Dostoevsky. Western influence further widened the class divide and continued under Catherine the Great, who followed Peter the Great. Four, four. While on the one hand, Catherine held correspondence with Voltaire and Diderot in France, as the portraying herself as the quintessential ruler of the Enlightenment, she, she tightened certain forms of serfdom that were only removed in 1851, as I said before. All in all, the, there arose in Russia a new kind of curious conflict of cultures. On one hand, a German type empire, if you like, with emphasis, emphasis on the military and the police. On the other, the fundamental idea of the Tsar as a ruler that was also a kind of messiah, who belonged to the people and who embodied the spirit of Russia. Eventually, this opposition reached the intelligentsia, or intelligentsia. The influence of, of this intelligentsia became critical in the 19th century and fed, fed the revolutionary temper that was eventually to issue into the 1917 revolution. Interestingly, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was the nobility that spearheaded the opposition to a Peter the Great type style empire. In time, during the century, the nobility rather became more, uh, more reactionary. Meanwhile, forming the new intelligentsia were now characters drawn from different, different classes. And it has been found easier to follow the development of the currents of thought by dividing the 19th century into decades, much as we identify the 1960s, 1970s, 80s, etc. We cannot review all the decades, but we'll extract, extract out of a large mass of related information and characters those who left a mark in what could be described as the prevailing mode of thought of the nation. One thing should be said about the 19th century, it produced one of the greatest literatures in the world, which is original, intense and soul-stirring. As I think I said before, after reading with some care any of the Russian literary masterpieces, the readers, at least most readers at least, feel somehow different inside, without being able to explain exactly why something unique to classic Russian literature. Meanwhile, the large mass of the Russian people lived by their orthodox fate, which gave them the strength to bear the sufferings of their life. They felt that serfdom was wrong, but did not hold the Tsar responsible. In the mind and soul of the people, the Tsar was a, a messianic figure that would eventually end the injustices once he could see through and beyond the circle of courtiers and courtesans that surrounded him. The Tsars, some of them at least, felt or seemed to feel within themselves the somewhat messianic character of their function. Even the last Tsar, Nicholas II, who was pious and religious. But we could say with the usual power of the afterthought that he had lost touch with the mood of the country and could not perceive that the mental perception of messianism was waning following the historical dramas of the early 20th century. I'm referring both to the politics of the balance of power among the nations of Europe and to the growing demand for emancipation by the starving and laboring masses. All in all, we could summarize the Russia of the 19th century as an immense country where the overwhelming majority were peasants, enslaved, or at least serfs, illiterate, but with their own popular culture based on faith. The ruling class, on the other hand, was idle, not particularly cultured, and besides, it had lost its religious faith and its sense of nationality. The Tsar was the anchor of religious belief, and he was surrounded by a large bureaucracy. I refer to, I refer to before to the ruling class, which is not the same as the intelligentsia, 
which, I mean, the intelligentsia was aware of the situation. Before we conclude this episode, we should point to another general characteristic of the Russian people, which again transpires when reading the Russian classics. Namely, the contradiction, that, <laughs> that contradiction is a characteristic of the, at large of Russia and of the Russian people. For on the one hand, they appear imperialistic and despotic, on the other, anarchic and lovers of freedom, nationalistic and equally animated by a universal spirit, cruel and humane, capable of inflicting suffering and at the same time sympathetic. These conditions or characteristics have confused many historians, especially historians in the pay of think tanks and politicians. Typical today are those who must find everything wrong with, with the Soviet Union. They choose to forget the help that the USSR gave to the country in Asia, in Africa, in South America in the form of raw material, technologies, specialists, doctors, military advisors, agronomists and so on. Whereas what the West has usually exported in the same countries has been violence, exploitation and the support for a local corrupting and corrupted elite. Furthermore, the commandment that capitalism won over communism in Russia overlooks one important historical truth. In March 17, 1991, in the only referendum allowed on the matter, 77.85% of voters voted to preserve the USSR as a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics in which the rights and freedom of an individual of any nationality will be fully guaranteed. As usual in history, there is more to be learned than what found in the media that toes the line of the leaders. Next time we will examine some important 19th century characters who had a great influence on Russian subsequent events. Until next time, I am Jimmy Molia for Historical Sketches. Good night. Mm -hmm.